My fellow Terrans, welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Jason Freeman, Space Camp graduate 1991 and present day Free Library Author Events Office Space Cadet. And I am excited to be here tonight to introduce Dr. Alan Stern and Dr. David Grinspoon. Uh, in today's political and social climate, some people see space exploration as a bit of a luxury, I think, uh, a frivolity unconnected from the everyday issues we face here on our pale blue dot. In considering tonight's subject matter and why it seems so important, I remember this T.S. Eliot line. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. So perhaps we need to know the cosmos to truly understand where we are, who we are, and where we're going. And if that doesn't work for you, you'd at least have to admit that taking a three billion mile drag race through the solar system to blaze past Pluto at 32,000 miles an hour on a trip that may never happen again is pretty damn cool. Tonight's first co-author is Dr. Alan Stern, principal investiga investigator of the New Horizons mission to Pluto, a planetary scientist and an aerospace executive and consultant. He has participated in a mind-blowing 29 space missions and has served in the loftiest strata of contemporary American space exploration. Winner of the American Astronomical, Astronautical Society's Carl Sagan Memorial Award, he has twice been named to Time Magazine's 100 list, which celebrates the men and women whose power, talent, or moral example is transforming the world. Tonight's other author is Dr. D David Grinspoon, the chair of astrobiology at the US Library of Congress, where he studies climate evolution, the conditions for life elsewhere in the cosmos, and space exploration strategy. He has consulted on interplanetary missions for several international space agencies and is on the team for NASA's Curiosity Mars rover. A contributor to a slew of periodicals and journals, he is the author of Earth in Human Hands, Shaping Our Planet's Future, a call to arms for us to recognize the perils of man-made biosphere change and to awaken our responsibility uh, as stewards of this planet. Tonight, these two authors join us uh, with Chasing New Horizons, an inside look at the science, politics, and logistics of the eponymously named mission to the edge of our solar system, which I earlier described as cool. Chasing New Horizons honors the men and women responsible for the most distant planetary exploration ever attempted and describes what the next billion miles will look like for this plucky little pilgrim of a space probe. Here to tell us more, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Alan Stern and Dr. David Grinspoon. Uh, I'm David Grinspoon. I'm gonna start off and set the stage a little bit and then uh, Alan Stern will come up and talk to you a bit and then uh, we'll both uh, entertain questions and, and have some discussion with you. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. It's exciting for us to uh, finally have the chance to share this book that we've been working on for the last few years, and this project that my co-author, Alan Stern, has been uh, in, in uh, one way or another working on for the last more than quarter of a century. Um, the book is Chasing New Horizons, and the first word in the subtitle, Inside, is important because there, there are a lot of books about space exploration, um, and in a way, you know how this story ends when we're building up the drama, will they get to Pluto or won't they? Because look at the cover of the book. Uh, spoiler, spoiler alert. Yet, I think what we, what we tried to do and what I think we succeed in doing is really telling you, taking you inside the project and the minds of the people involved and the struggles that they went through and, and really showing you how it works. Uh, telling some sides of space exploration that, that you may not have seen before. Uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, struggle and intrigue and, and drama, and, and, and this, particular, uh, this story in particular um, I love because uh, it's emblematic in some ways of, of modern space exploration. Um, you'll, we'll tell you some stories tonight, and then if you read the book, you'll, you'll see that uh, it was incredible what the team of people went through to make this mission happen. Uh, they started off when they were very young, and in a way didn't know what they were doing, which is sort of good <laughs> because they didn't know what they were getting themselves in for because if they had, you know, uh, maybe they, uh, who knows if they would have had the fortitude to keep going because it was really a much longer journey than anyone ever expected. And I'm not even talking about the three million, three billion mile journey and nine year 
journey out to Pluto from Earth. I'm talking about the incredible journey of navigating the, uh, getting outside the beltway <laughs> in Washington and navigating all the hurdles and um, just the obstacles to, um, to trying to uh, follow, to trying to chase down um, this dream. So the, um, let's see, is this going to work? Yes. Um, as I said, you know how it ends, and we'll get back to the wonders of Pluto that finally uh, were revealed to all of us when this spacecraft made it uh, to the planet Pluto in July 2015. But I just couldn't resist sharing with you one teaser image. This is one of our favorite images that we got at Pluto because it just reveals so much of the character of what that planet is like. We'll come back to talking more about this, but you can see uh, it's a pretty interesting place. There's some hazes in the atmosphere and some, some mountains and uh, you know some bizarre kinds of landforms that we're still struggling to fit into our, our ways of describing planets, and it's, it, it's really a wonderland. But that's, that's sort of a teaser. Now to get back to the story, we uh, ground this story in some um, history, some 20th century history that really starts in 1930 with this guy, Clyde Tombaugh, an American astronomer who discovered the planet Pluto. And um, Clyde's story is, uh, I think, just really amazing. And, and uh, I, I won't go into a lot of detail now, but basically it's a classic American uh, success story because he was born into a Depression-era farm life in Kansas, uh, was uh, very poor, um, uh, you know, his family was struggling to, uh, to get by during the Depression, and he uh, was fascinated with astronomy and self-taught and built his own telescopes, ground the lenses himself, and dreamed of being an astronomer, but had no idea how he would ever sort of be able to leave the farm. He didn't even imagine in his wildest dreams he'd ever be able to afford to go to college, but he looked at the sky at night when, you know, when there was time when the harvest, when there wasn't um, too much work to do on, on the farm, and, and he would make sketches of the planet Mars, uh, and he mailed them off to observatories, uh, sort of like a message in the bottle, you know, wondering if anybody would ever look at them. And then one day he gets a letter from the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. Uh, Dear Mr. Tombo, we're very impressed with your sketches of the planet Mars. We have a job opening <laughs> for an assistant astronomer. Would you be interested? Uh, and of course he was, and so for the, you know, practically the very first time Clyde left the farm and got on a train, went to Arizona, and uh, rode into history, not right away, because he spent a year of painstaking work, cold nights uh, in the telescope, looking at uh, image after image, um, images that looked like this, of star fields, looking for an object that was moving, in just the right way, and after a year of this, with a lot of people telling him, forget it, kid, this, you'll never find it, people have already looked, it's futile, he saw this little spot jumping from plate to plate between January 23rd and January 29th, 1930, and it was moving in just the right way, so he knew, after going back and checking it on subsequent nights to make sure it was right, he realized he had discovered a, a new planet. And so briefly, Clyde Tombaugh was the only person on Earth who knew about the planet Pluto, and then of course he went and told his boss, and after they checked it really carefully, they announced it to the world, and um, you know, the rest is history. So what's cool is that that was 1930, so it's recent. There are still people alive now who are alive when Clyde Tombaugh discovered Pluto. Uh, and that's one of the things that, that I love about this story, is the sort of multi-generational aspect. Um, Clyde's widow was at the launch of New Horizons. His, uh, his kids were at the Pluto encounter. Um, and the generation that started space exploration in the 1960s was inspired by him and his contemporaries. And Alan Stern, my co-author, and I are very much uh, sort of children of Apollo and of that time in space history. We um, grew up in this era and um, both remember the Apollo missions as these seminal moments when we were kids, and the first planetary missions. This is Mariner 4, which was the first spacecraft to successfully fly by and return pictures of Mars on uh, January uh, 15th, 1960. 
five. Remember that date. Um, and um, so these first voyages into the solar system were very inspiring to uh, those of us who growing up in that time and a lot of us who became space explorers look back on these first missions as what, what got us into the game. Well, this is a National Geographic issue which came out in August 1970. Um, and Alan and I both remember this as something that was really cool because on the cover it had Voyage to the Planets and it had all these artists' conceptions of what the other planets looked like, a few of which we had already visited with spacecraft, but most of which we hadn't. And they talked about uh, the plans to come in the coming decades of the 70s and 80s. And there was this idea that we could do a grand tour. Oh, uh, uh, whoops. Um, there was this idea, I'll skip that for a second. There was this idea that we could do a grand tour of the solar system, that the planets were going to be lined up just right with the orbits of all the giant planets of Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune in such a way that only happens every couple hundred years so that if you hit Jupiter just right and get a gravity assist, you can then have it fling you onto Saturn and get a gravity assist from Saturn and have it fling you on and fling you on. You could visit all the planets and you could go to Pluto that way, all within basically uh, a little more than a decade. And this was in this National Geographic issue, they talked about this as something that was possibly going to happen starting in the 1970s. And it was interesting because in that issue, there was a chart that told what you knew about all the planets, what we knew about all the planets, and had their mass and temperature and the orbits and all that. And then you get to Pluto, and there's this line of boxes with question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. We knew almost nothing about it. We knew what its orbit was like. We didn't know how big it was, what it was made out of, uh, almost really anything about it. So it was the mystery world, and because of that, there was a lot of fun science fiction and lore about Pluto being the farthest outpost in the solar system and being this mystery world where science fiction writers could invent anything they want. So there were all these stories about Pluto being this mysterious outpost to the stars and you know a lot of fun speculation when we didn't know anything. But then uh, the Grand Tour mission did happen in the 70s. Uh, it became the Voyager missions, which you've heard about, uh, the Voyager spacecraft, Voyager 1 and 2, really famous, seminal voyage to the, to the planets Jupiter, uh, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. There's Voyager. And originally it was going to go to Pluto, too. But for various reasons, which we discuss in the book, the Voyagers, Neither of them went to Pluto. They had to make some tough choices. Um, and uh, they probably made the right decision at the time because Pluto was a long shot for Voyager to even ever reach. But it left this one part of the solar system still unexplored. And the last place that Voyager went, Voyager 2, went to the planet Neptune. Here's one of the last pictures Voyager ever took of a planet. This is the, the edge, the limb of Neptune, backlit mostly by the sun. And this off the edge is the mysterious moon Triton, Jupiter's icy moon Triton, which is a really cool place with, you know, geysers and flowing ices and stuff. And, and Triton hinted at what Pluto might be like. And that was it for exploration of new worlds circa 1989. And then that's when, that's the very year that this young band of dreamers that we write about in this book, they got the idea that they wanted to send a mission to Pluto. Alan Stern, who you'll hear from in a minute, uh, and a gang of other, a small number of other very young scientists in their 20s and 30s, grad students and postdocs, they said, hey, let's keep going after Voyager. Let's not stop. There's more worlds to explore. Let's go to Pluto. And the powers that be basically said, no, that's not going to happen. Um, and they said, well, we're not going to take no, basically. And they started working on a plan to make this happen. And uh, that's really um, the story of, uh, of Chasing New Horizons, is how that plan ultimately, after a lot of false starts and uh, sort of outrageous slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, you know, and like a lot of things going wrong and setbacks and cancellations and you know, near disasters, how it became a successful mission. And um, right at the beginning of sp the space age, this guy, Alan Stern, there he is with his first scientific instrument, um, his, uh, his, his first microscope. Uh, he was born um, within, uh, what, two weeks of, uh, 
of uh, the launch of Sputnik. Um, and uh, you know, that's, that's when uh, our story basically begins. And I'm going to now let Alan come up and uh, tell you a little bit about New Horizons. And then um, I'll, I'll get up and say a couple more things. And then we want to, uh, to hear from you and have some discussion. So ladies and gentlemen, Alan Stern. That's embarrassing, so we'll just, I have to get some pictures of you with your fro. <laughs> um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit of the story of New Horizons, but I have to tell you, the book that David wrote is unbelievable because it weaves a tapestry of science and engineering and politics and humans with uh, drive uh, and dreams uh, who face many defeats and ultimately triumph. Uh, and nearly fail to triumph at the very last moment. And it's just a beautifully written book, and somebody ought to make a movie. There. Um, when we started this, this is a group of scientists that we called the, the, um, uh, the Pluto Underground. Uh, this picture was taken back in 1991, a couple years after we got started. Um, one of these is the pointer. This top thing. Uh, that's a pointer? Ah, OK. Yeah, that's me. Fran Bagenal, other people who appear in the book like Mark Bowie. Um, there are various other characters, but um, um, David spent a lot of time talking to me because I led the project, but he also talked to dozens of other people. And the book has passages from his interviews with people at every stage of the project, right up through the entire flight mission. Um, how did I advance that? Okay. Okay. Um, and as David said, um, there was a long period where we were just trying, you know, it's a simple thing, we are just trying to raise a billion dollars <laughs> with no idea how to do it. We, we're making it up as we go, we're trying to figure it out, how does Washington really work, all of that. Everything's good? Okay. So, the thing is, we got close a number of times, but each time, Lucy stole the football. And you'll read those stories, and, and some had villains in them, uh, people who had, uh, other objectives. Um, sometimes it was uh, just random. A spacecraft blew up four days before reaching Mars, just as we were about to get funded. And the money was taken and decided to re rebuild that spacecraft, and we had to start over. And things like this happened again and again, and it's, it's an amazing story. Um, it's a wonder we actually got it done, but we did. Uh, you know, Pluto orbits in this region of the solar system beyond those giant planets out to Neptune that David described. It's very, very far away. There's only a dot in the distance in every photograph ever taken from the Earth. Even in the Hubble Space Telescope images, it's just a smudgy little globe. You can't tell anything about what's going on on the surface, really. And it, um, it orbits in this new third zone of the solar system called the Kuiper Belt, which was only discovered in the 90s. I mean, in a way, it was Clyde Tombaugh that discovered it in 1930, but it was in the 90s that the cohort to Pluto, the other small planets of the Kuiper Belt, and all the other denizens of the Kuiper Belt, the trillions of comets and hundreds of thousands of planetesimals that orbit there, were found. And this is kind of the solar system's attic. This is a, a region of the solar system that's vast. It's seven times the size of everything from the Sun to Neptune. And it is filled with all this ancient material and all these small planets that, in fact, outnumber the giant planets and uh, terrestrial rocky planets like Earth combined. So eventually we sold it uh, and we built a spacecraft. This is New Horizons um, on the factory floor in a clean room. Uh, and you can see the dish antenna that's up on top and all the gold mylar, the, the gold foil that's on the outside that's a thermal blanket. Inside the thermal blanket is a bulletproof shield made of Kevlar to protect it against micrometeorite strikes because the spacecraft is traveling almost 10 miles per second. And at that speed, being hit even by something tiny, like a rice pellet, would shred the spacecraft. Uh, it's basically the power of being hit by a Mack truck at that speed. Um, <coughs> outside of the spacecraft, let's see if I can make this work again, there are some of the, are the scientific instruments that are mounted to look out, cameras, spectrometers, plasma instruments, and so forth. This is a little bit more technical drawing. Spacecraft weighs about 1,000 pounds, including the fuel supply that's on board. Um, I'll uh, just point out a couple of things. The, uh, on, the, on the right, at roughly the 3 o'clock position, there's a thing that looks like a hair curler. 
It's not a hair curler. It's a nuclear power generator because we're going so far from the sun that you can't use solar power. And then the triangular portion of the spacecraft, that's called the spacecraft bus. And inside are all the systems that are needed for the entire journey. And we actually built a fully redundant spacecraft. So there are two guidance systems and two communication systems and two power distribution systems and uh, two main computers and two guidance computers, two of everything except the structure, the nuclear power generator, and the seven scientific instruments, which have overlapping capabilities, but we didn't fly two of each. Uh, and for scale, the dish antenna is about two meters across. It's about this big. Now, compared to Voyager, the previous outer planet spacecraft that David told you about, um, if Voyager was a houseboat, this is a hamster. It's a tiny little spacecraft in comparison, but it packs a lot more scientific firepower because it was built with 21st century technology in the early 2000s. And, you know, if you think of the analogy of computers, they went from mainframes that filled a room back in the 70s when Voyager was built to little tablets and laptops that are much less expensive but have much more power than those room-filling computers. New Horizons, similar evolution in the electronics. And so New Horizons, much smaller, much less expensive, but packs a lot more firepower, a lot more capability. Now, David told you about Clyde Tombaugh. One thing he didn't mention is that Clyde had said before he died, as we were trying to get a mission to Pluto, if that ever happened, he would like to see his ashes sent on board to his planet. And in fact, right as we were getting close to flying, uh, to launching in 2005, I contacted Patsy, his widow, and sort of delicately asked, was she in favor of this? And in fact, had they saved ashes for this journey? And they had, she was very excited about it. And she sent them to me and uh, we built this little um, canister and used it as a balance weight on the spacecraft. So it was serving an engineering purpose. And, uh, and it says, interned herein are the remains of American Clyde W. Tombaugh, discoverer of Pluto and the solar system's third zone. Adele and Muron's boy, Patricia's husband, um, Annette and Alden's father, astronomer, teacher, punster, and friend, Clyde Tombaugh, and it gives his dates, 1906 to 1997. And we launched him on the fastest spacecraft ever launched. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about our team. I said that the book is, is written with first-person accounts from everyone from NASA administrators to individual scientists and flight controllers and engineers on the team. Um, this is the flight control team. It's actually only a few dozen people. Uh, but when we built it, we had a much bigger team. It was 2,500 Americans worked to build the spacecraft, the rocket, and the nuclear power supply. Um, but this is right after the flyby, and it's a picture of just the flight team. It's about as many people are as in this room. It's the flight controllers, the engineers, the science team, uh, the management team. Uh, public affairs, all that. All of them are in this, in this single room. Uh, and this is uh, just the science team out at the launch pad with our monster, Atlas V, um, just a few days before we launched it. So by then, New Horizons had been built, fully tested, placed up in the nose cone of this cavernous rocket that was built to launch school bus-sized satellites. And New Horizons was so tiny, I can't show you how tiny, but it's about the size of a small desk that you would walk in the payload bay, it's 70 feet tall, and it's virtually empty. And we did that because if you launch a rocket virtually empty, you're gonna get the highest possible speed out of it. So we built this very compact little spacecraft, and I used to just call it the Atlas's hood ornament. <laughs> so here it is a few days before we launched it, and here's the launch sequence on the 19th of January, 2006. Now that vehicle is as big as a skyscraper in downtown Philadelphia. It's 225 feet tall. It generates two and a half million pounds of thrust. And when it takes off, that cloud layer, that cloud deck is at 10,000 feet. Watch how quickly this baby leaps off the pad. Imagine a downtown building doing this. And it's at 10,000 feet in a matter of just about 10 seconds. It went supersonic 15 seconds after that and was in Earth orbit going 18,000 miles an hour in eight minutes flat. So on the first stage, we're burning five solid rocket motors and the two liquid-fueled engines that you see in the center. 
And the solids eventually run out of their fuel, and they're big, heavy casings because they're seven stories tall. And so we let go of those. You'll see them separate here um, shortly. And, and then the vehicle can really accelerate because it's much lighter, and it's just running on the main engines. So when these, co these solids come off, you'll notice it's very carefully timed so they come off in two waves. Um, we have two come off and then three come off. There they go, and then the other three. And now it's, it's burning on the first stage until it runs out of fuel. Then there's a second stage that puts us in Earth orbit and then eventually took us out of Earth orbit and directed us off to Jupiter where we could get a gravity assist for even more speed. And uh, this is the nose cone coming off because we're now at space altitudes. It's only been about a minute since the launch and it's already up in space. And then it passes behind this cloud and that is the last anyone ever saw of New Horizons. And ever since then, and it's been more than 12 years now, we've been communicating with it by radio. No one's ever seen it. Um, as I said, we were in Earth orbit in eight minutes. We flew halfway around the Earth, reignited the engines at the, at the injection point to go fly to Jupiter, took us out of Earth orbit, and in a total of 40 minutes from when we left that launch pad, the spacecraft was on its own, the fastest spacecraft ever launched. For those of you that remember those Apollo missions we talked about when David and I were children, astronauts would launch at 25,000 miles an hour and reach the moon three days later. New Horizons did it in nine hours. If you do the math, that's about 0.3 days. So we're really moving. And uh, we went off across the solar system for three billion miles, and it took us almost a decade, nine and a half years. Even at that blinding speed, almost a million miles per day, every day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, we flew nine and a half years, more than two presidential administrations, all the way across our solar system to the very frontier where Pluto lies. Still never going to make this work. There it is, right there, um, in July of 2015. Um, along the way, people used to ask us, do you work on New Horizons? I know it's hibernating. What else are you working on while it's out there drifting along? And you know, the Voyager project that David talked about had 450 people on the flight control team. We had to do all that work with just 50 people. So we were very busy the entire time. I would laugh because people would be coming to me on my project saying, there's too much work. It's nonstop. We've been at this four and a half years. We'll never get it done by the time we get there. Because we had to take care of that spacecraft. We had to get all the scientific instruments operating and calibrated, conduct a Jupiter flyby, navigate it towards Pluto, fire the engines from time to time for course corrections, plan all the software for the flyby. As we later learned, there might be hazards at Pluto. So we actually had to plan the flyby plus three backup flybys, test all of those thoroughly even put them up on the spacecraft and fake it out so the clocks thought it was 2015 in the middle of nowhere and it was conducting rehearsals, conduct mission simulations on the ground and do many more things. So we were working the entire time. We were really working our tails off um, all the way across the solar system from 2006 when we launched until 2015 when we arrived. This is Alice Bowman. Uh, she is the mission operations manager um, since the inception of the project, Alice has been in charge of our entire flight control team. How many of you have seen the movie Apollo 13? Just about everybody, of course, you're here. <laughs> well, if you remember uh, Ed Harris's role, the guy in charge of mission control, that's Alice's role for New Horizons. Um, her title is Mission Operations Manager, which has this handy acronym, MOM. <laughs> so people call her MOM a lot. Uh, and uh, as David describes in the book, as we got close to Pluto, um, a disaster struck 10 days before, after traveling nine and a half years, 10 days before we reached Pluto, on a day meant for fireworks, but not this kind, July the 4th, 2015, my cell phone rings, it's the project manager, and he says, Alan, we've lost contact with the spacecraft. That's like a line out of a movie. You know, it's like Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> um, this is never supposed to happen. When you lose contact with spacecraft, you'd usually never get it back. Something catastrophic happened, like that Mars mission that blew up that I mentioned to you. Uh, and, but Alice and her team diagnosed that problem and fixed the problem, and then found out that all of the computer files that we had put on the spacecraft to instruct it through the flyby, dozens of computer files for guidance, for navigation, for running all the scientific instruments, for everything had been erased in, in the computer reset that happened. They have spent months since January putting all those files up carefully and making sure they were all intact 
and all the checksums were right and all that. And they had three days till flyby began, and it was unbelievable. If you saw that movie, Apollo 13, you remember people sleeping on desks or under desks and eating pizza and, you know, um, all their meals were coming out of vending machines. That was Alice's team for three days straight. It was unbelievable. And they did it. They saved the entire mission. And with four hours to spare, they got it all done, and we started the flyby on time. Really, truly amazing story. Somebody ought to make a movie. <laughs> now, um, in order to achieve the scientific objectives at Pluto, we actually had to fly through one little aim point right here that allowed us to cross through Pluto's shadow and its big moon Charon's shadow so that our spectrometers could study Pluto's atmosphere um, using the sun to backlight it and to look for an atmosphere around the big moon. In order to do that, we had to fly through a little window in space, a little rectangular window that was 40 by 60 miles, which is pretty big. It's the size of a county. But when you're aiming from 3 billion miles away, it's really tiny out there, right? Um, and so we did the math, and it actually works out. It's the equivalent of hitting a golf ball in LA and sinking a hole in one in Philadelphia in one try, okay? Not only that, though, because all of the moons and the planet are moving, the spacecraft has to arrive at just the right time because all the programs count on the moons being at known places. And so when you work that math out, we not only had to fly through that window in space, we also had to arrive within plus or minus nine minutes of the time that we set when we launched it nine and a half years before. Now, I fly a lot on airplanes, and it's rare that my flights are within nine minutes of on time, right, just across the country. Um, but we did it, and in fact, we arrived 86 seconds off target after nine and a half years, and I'm proud to say we were 86 seconds early. <laughs> Thank you. It was really quite an amazing experience after working on this for a dozen years to raise the money, a four-year breakneck pace to build this spacecraft in time to launch it for the last Jupiter gravity assist window of the 2000s, um, and then a nine-and-a-half-year flight um, to actually be there at mission control and to see the data start raining down from the Kuiper belt and to see this team of people, and we invited so many people back that had worked on it that had left the project um, when we were building it, um, and to see the pandemonium when we succeeded. And there's a great picture that's coming up. There's a couple of great pictures. This is Alice and I right after she announced that the spacecraft had checked back in and the uh, flyby had been successful. This is in our, our mission control. This is a live picture, not staged, of science teams seeing the first high-resolution image of Pluto. Imagine working on something for 15 years of your life, having one shot at it. It's all going to work on that Tuesday morning, or it's not. Right? And Pluto could have turned out to be some dull ice ball, but it didn't. It turned out to have tremendous scientific personality. And uh, that room was hugs and tears and smiles and uh, uh, fist bumps and high fives. And you just, it was amazing to be there. So I thought I'd close with a few images of the Pluto system just to show you a little bit about what we got. This is kind of a family portrait of um, Pluto, the little planet with a big heart. Sharon, it's Texas-sized moon, and two of its four small satellites. This is Nix and Hydra, which we discovered with the Hubble Space Telescope. Yeah, this is a, a close-up of the, uh, the four small satellites. Um, Styx, Nix, Kerberos, and Hydra by name. Um, and Styx is the closest, and Hydra is the farthest from Pluto. And down at the bottom for scale is the big Texas-sized satellite, Charon. I'll show you Charon in more detail, but um, uh, these four small satellites that are, you know, individually the size of uh, counties to New England states are, um, it turns out, just water ice. They're made of water ice. Um, they're very highly reflective, as bright as freshly driven snow. Um, we can count the craters on their surface and determine their age. And the idea behind that is the longer a surface has been out suffering impacts, the more craters it will show. Just like if you run out in a rainstorm with a sheet of paper, you'll have, the longer you leave it out there, the more dots will appear. Same idea. Um, so that's the four small satellites. We have color imagery of them. We have spectroscopy to tell us about their surface composition. We now know a lot about them. 
This is the Pluto Charon pair, and they're really a double planet. This is the first mission ever to visit a double planet, a binary. And uh, the interesting thing about it is that the two, two in the pair don't look anything alike. They were born together. They've lived for four and a half billion years together. Um, same temperature, same radiation, same bombardment environment. They don't look a thing alike. There's Pluto up front, big and colorful and, and uh, uh, bright and highly reflective. It has an atmosphere. Sharon, kind of the dullard sister of the pair. Um, it's uh, much darker. It's much less colorful. It has no atmosphere. It does have an interesting surface geology. And uh, this is Sharon up close. Its surface is also made entirely of water ice, except for tiny outcrops of other things where craters have punched a hole through the water ice and excavated material from depth. It has a, uh, a weird red, dark polar cap, unlike anything ever seen in the solar system. All of its surfaces can be dated to be four and a half billion years old. Its geological engine ran out almost as soon as it was born. The canyon that runs across the surface that you see running across the equator from left to right, that canyon is 10 times longer, 10 times wider, and 10 times deeper than the Grand Canyon. It's the largest canyon in the solar system. I could go on about Sharon, but I don't have time. Uh, they're going to pull the hook here in a minute. So let's talk about Pluto, the bell of the ball. And this is a set of images that we took with New Horizons and wrapped in a computer, wrapped on a sphere, as if you were an astronaut standing about 1,000 kilometers above the surface. And what we're actually showing you here, um, you see the green box in the upper right in that inset. Um, that's a context image. We're looking at the, basically the left or the western side of the heart on Pluto's surface. That heart is a glacier the size of the state of Texas. And we call it Sputnik. And there you see it in this close-up right here. All of this is Sputnik. It's surrounded by mountain ranges. Those mountains tower up to 20,000 feet. Those mountains are made of water ice, but Sputnik itself is made of condensed nitrogen. The stuff that you're breathing right now snowed on the Pluto's surface and formed a layer, we, we don't know how many miles deep, in this glacier. And uh, you don't see any craters on there, meaning it's very young. We have searched and searched and searched and never found a single crater, meaning it was born yesterday. Pluto created something the size of Texas yesterday geologically. No one expected small planets could be so active after four billion years. So I like to say, apparently we learned that Pluto can't read. It didn't read any of the textbooks. <laughs> and uh, it's revolutionized our view of how the geophysics of planets work. It's really upended our view. And we also learned a lot of other interesting things about Pluto, about its atmosphere, about its weather patterns, about the fact that it probably had liquids on its surface, it probably has an ocean in its interior right now. And there's more. Pluto is littered with mountain ranges, and many of them have snow caps, just like in the Rockies where I live in Colorado. But these snow caps that you can see there, they look like water ice because it's bright and reflective, but it's not. It's actually natural gas condensed methane as a frosting that's precipitated out onto those, the top of those mountain ranges. And here's a uh, picture that shows you how rugged the surface is. This is like the one that David showed at the beginning, in which you can see Pluto's atmosphere and the concentric haze layers that stretch up literally half a million meters into the sky to orbital altitudes. We found clouds on the surface. We found volcanoes the size of Mauna Loa on this little planet. Uh, and these mountain ranges are all made of water ice, and then they're frosted with methane and nitrogen and the other, other materials. Well, I'm going to end basically here, and then David's going to stand up. I'm, this is my favorite image of the entire flyby. It's a natural color image looking back at Pluto's atmosphere, which is actually blue, just like the Earth's sky. And I'll tell you why this is my favorite image. It's not that it's the most important scientifically. There's lots of scientific results that have come out of this image. Um, and there's a lot more to it than you can see on this, this projector. But it's emotionally important to me and to our team because the only way to get an image like this with the sunlight filtering through Pluto's atmosphere is to be on the far side of Pluto. And we worked 26 years to fly past Pluto and this is the we did it image taken from the far side of Pluto. And thank you very much, David.
All right, I'm just gonna um, say a couple of really quick things um, because we really wanna make sure we have time to, uh, to get you guys involved in the discussion. But um, you remember when um, I mentioned Mariner 4 in July 1965, here's the New York Times cover from that day. Um, the first pictures of Mars from the first flyby of Mars. 50 years to the day later, Here's the New York Times cover showing New Horizons picture from the last flyby of, the last first flyby of one of the classically known planets in our solar system. So it really it was a capstone to what Carl Sagan used to call the initial reconnaissance of the solar system. And in the team, um, for years of planning, they used to talk about getting the New York Times picture. That was a, a phrase. And here it is on the cover of the New York Times, uh, above the fold, and in fact, uh, hundreds of newspapers all around the world. Um, the, the reaction was incredible. Uh, more than anybody anticipated, the, the public, um, for some reason, and we can speculate uh, some, uh, about those reasons, is, is in love with Pluto. Um, it always has been. It's a kind of an underdog, unknown, farthest planet, all these reasons. And, but the outpouring of interest uh, it, it surprised everybody. The, the number, a, a billion web hits, the, the biggest response NASA ever got. And the experience of being at the encounter was tremendous, not just because of the excitement there, but also uh, with social media and everything. There was a sense of a global phenomenon. Everybody was sharing the images, and it was this, this moment of humanity um, around the world sort of experiencing this expansion of our, of our, of our knowledge of the universe together. Uh, and it was kind of fun, all the memes that were generated and all the creativity that people uh, displayed online. Some of them are silly and some of them are just really cool. Um, but, you know, just the outpouring of interest and creative response to this was just so fun and, and so exciting to see people get, get so involved. Um, I could go on. Uh, th th it was, uh, it's just been an ex uh, incredible experience to, to see this mission unfold over all these years, to get to work um, with the team a little bit, uh, and then also to uh, get to know Alan and, and all these other participants and work with Alan over the last few years to uh, tell this story. And we're, we're just thrilled now that the book is out and we can share it with you. And with that, um, let's get Alan back up here and we're going to um, have a seat on stage and we uh, would love to uh, entertain some questions. And they're gonna we're on our way to another flyby a billion miles further out um, of a building block of these small planets like Pluto, an ancient building block, uh, maybe the size of Philadelphia, greater Philadelphia. Um, we nicknamed it Ultima Thule, which is a, a Norse phrase that means beyond the farthest frontiers. And it's a very easy date to remember. We will get there on New Year's Eve and make closest approach on New Year's Day this year. So December 31st and January 1st, 2019, um, we'll be there. And that's our next step. And then we'll go on from there exploring out across the, uh, the Kuiper Belt. Um, so, uh, so there's this debate about whether Pluto is still a planet or a dwarf planet, and you didn't address it. What's your view on that? Well, we called it a planet throughout the presentation. I think you know our view. <laughs> and there's actually no debate. Um, um, what there is is some misinformation. Um, you know, I like to make the analogy that you know, there are lots of different specialties in the space field. Um, and astronomers are not experts in planetary science, just as we are not experts in astrophysics. Um, a convention of astronomers got together and voted as we were discovering that the solar system is littered with lots of planets uh, in the third zone, in the Kuiper Belt. Uh, and they worried that this would be a bad image for astronomy if school kids couldn't remember the names of all the planets anymore. So we should really just put a fence around them at eight, um, which is a very anti-scientific idea. You know, we don't limit the number of rivers or mountains on the Earth, just the ones we can remember, right? We don't limit the periodic table to eight elements, and we don't limit the number of states to 50, to, from 50 down to eight. But that's what the astronomers wanted to do. Now, planetary scientists never really bought that. In fact, the week after uh, that vote uh, by astronomers, more planetary scientists signed a petition saying BS then voted in, in that vote in the astronomers' meeting, but the press didn't cover that. And so it's kind of a non-story in planetary science in many ways. And you go to planetary science meetings or you open up technical journals, 
and papers about Pluto and about many other small planets use the word planet all the time because we don't know what else to call it. And frankly, you wouldn't either. If you saw a picture of Pluto on, on the viewfinder of the Starship Enterprise, you would say, oh, they're orbiting a planet this week. Right? Yeah, and we, we don't devote a lot of space to this in the book. In fact, we, we originally were gonna have a chapter about it, and we realized there are more interesting things in this story to talk about. But in fact, as Alan was saying, uh, amongst planetary scientists, we use the word planet to talk about Pluto. And there, there are a lot of sort of jury-rigged uh, aspects of that definition that just don't work. They, the definition. The, yeah, the, 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 the definition you read about in the newspaper when it supposedly got demoted, uh, they defined a planet in terms of what's orbiting around it, not in terms of the nature of the object itself. So it leads to a lot of absurdities. If, if you took that definition and you moved the Earth elsewhere in the solar system, it would no longer be a planet. Um, so we just decided, and a lot of people in our field just, just kind of ignore that. And um, we think in the long run, the, the, the usage of the term will, will it, it, it'll sort of correct itself. But um, uh, y you can tell we, uh, we have a certain uh, view of this. <laughs> Would you comment on the work being led by Jeff Bezos and the implications of going from government to private exploration? You want to crack that? Yeah. Um, well, we're both pretty excited by it. Um, it's, uh, you know, a whole new era, really, of space exploration. Uh, we're big fans of NASA. NASA will always have a role, but NASA doesn't have to do everything. And um, there are aspects of space exploration that it, it really makes sense to have other players in the game. And, and uh, the technology has changed, and um, it's gotten cheaper, and people are innovating in ways that it, where it really makes sense now to have uh, private, uh, you know, they're, they're realizing they can make a profit. And part of it is because they've innovated these reusable rockets. Um, and it makes so much more sense. Uh, as, as Alan says, you know, you don't, every time you, you call a cab, they don't, you know, throw away the, <laughs> the cab and, and, and build a new one. Uh, that's what we used to do with rockets. So uh, the innovation uh, happening because all these private players are getting into the game are, are kind of spurring uh, space flight to get cheaper and uh, there are more, more players and there's, it's going to be more accessible. More people are going to be go, able to go into space. And uh, I think we're, we're both pretty excited about that. I think we're at the beginning of a whole new age uh, and a lot, a lot of innovation. And thank goodness for guys like Branson and Bezos and Musk and so forth who, who have been very successful and know how to make money and are now applying it towards this very 21st century revolution uh, that's, uh, that's really changing the face of space exploration. So you had to make a lot of decisions early regarding the scientific instruments, compromises and decisions, not really knowing what was going to be there when you get there. Looking back now, is there something that you wish you had put on the spacecraft that you know, if we send another one, definitely want one of these. Yeah, that's a really good question, and we've talked about it in the science team. But, you know, it's, it, it's not free. Uh, we had a certain amount of money, a certain amount of mass that we could put on the payload. You could only draw a certain amount of power, and they had to be instruments that you could actually build in time to get it launched. And when you look at all those constraints, we've looked back and said, what should we have done within the constraints that we didn't do? What instrument would you throw off, and what would you replace it with? And we came to the uh, conclusion that we wouldn't change a thing, that we did it right, um, that every one of the instruments made important scientific discoveries, and that we can't think of anything we should have flown that would have made a big difference. Now, if we go back with an orbiter, which I'd like to see us do, and stay and really map the whole system and watch it's, how it's changing in time, then there are other instruments that we should bring because we have uh, new capabilities, mass spectrometers to study the atmosphere, radars to penetrate down through the glaciers, uh, tracking devices that'll let us determine if there really is an ocean on the inside and how massive it is, things like that. But for the first flyby, I think we did it just right. And I think that's part of why we won the competition to do it. Any and all space exploration is great, and the New, new Horizons was particularly awesome. But to me, the uh, maybe one of the prime scientific and the philosophical questions is about extraterrestrial life. Mars is sexy now, but the presence of long-term liquid water on it is pretty slim. I don't know, why isn't there a mad rush to get to Europa, Enceladus, one of these? I know, I think NASA is talking about one in the 2020s, but uh, what's, the, what's the plans for that and how do you 
and other people in your circle feel about this idea. Well, you have one of the world's premier astrobiologists right here. That's why I'm here. Well, I mean, I, I, I agree with you that that's, in a way, you know, the uber question that motivates all this exploration. But of course, we have to explore really w widely because we don't want to have preconceived notions about where there may be life and may not be life. And one thing that's really incredible that New Horizons discovered on Pluto is that there's pretty good evidence now that there is a liquid water ocean inside of Pluto. So add, you mentioned Europa Enceladus, add to the list of possible places for life now the planet Pluto. Uh, you know, as far as we understand what it is required, and, and as far as we understand may not be that far because we, don't, we only know of life on one planet, so we, we, we've got to be careful about extrapolating, but it's, our best idea is that for life you need three things, liquid water, an energy source, and organic molecules. And now it's looking like Pluto has a liquid water ocean. Obviously, there's energy sources. There's something moving around, that, you know, those nitrogen glaciers that, that Alan showed. Um, and uh, there's also, we know there's organic material because that, that uh, methane atmosphere is uh, interacting with, with, with sunlight and there's red stuff on the surface uh, snowing down, which is, seems to be organics. So all those requirements are probably met on Pluto. So, um, you know, you're right, we've got to explore Europa, we've got to explore Enceladus, but, uh, you know, we can't have too narrow an idea about where to look for life, and I would actually include Pluto on that list as possible homes for life, given what we know now. Well, Dr. Stern, uh, I know you've used the term uh, Pluto being a small planet several times. In relation to the Earth, what is its size? Oh, it's, it's, uh, it's actually pretty easy. If you uh, put Pluto over the United States, the continental United States, it just about blots it out. So uh, it's like the size of a, a, a continent like Australia. I mean, it's much more massive in Australia because Australia is just a surface feature on the Earth, right? So it's, um, it's uh, about 1,600 miles in diameter. And, uh, and uh, I'm trying to put this in... Uh, in, in terms people would understand. Um, well, it's about 1.6 times 10 to the 25th grams. Does that help? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Um, I love it when you talk like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, a lot of people got the idea back in 2006 when Pluto was so-called demoted by astronomers that it didn't exist anymore or that it was really just some sort of like an ornament on a tree. But it's actually this really vast object that you know, if you've ever driven across the United States, um, a drive around Pluto's equator, uh, its circumference is uh, six times two pi times further than driving coast to coast, or about that in rough terms. So it's quite a large object. This is apropos that question over there, because I was wondering, given how the size of it was described, if one were able to stand at the highest point of the highest mountain and look this way and that, would one get a different sense of curvature to the horizon? And then answer that with regard to Sharon also. And separate point, I heard you guys say on the radio that this uh, the spacecraft will uh, continue out there past the time that the Earth has uh, gone dead. And therefore, the idea that if we were to be able to notice a UFO and identify that it's clearly an item sent here by a higher intelligence, we would still not be certain that that intelligence still existed in the place. It's just so chilling. It's just so amazing. Anyway, thanks. Those are Wonderful two good, stuff. Those are two good questions. Can I address the second one and you address the first one? Sure. So, okay. so um, that's a really interesting point. But the thing is, if a UFO comes here, uh, uh, if, if, if a, a spaceship actually sent by an alien civilization comes to Earth, it will be sent to Earth. If it's just traveling at random, through the galaxy, not piloted, there's virtually no chance that it would come here because space is so big and empty. Well, New Horizons, after it leaves the solar system, isn't heading towards any star or any planet. Um, so almost surely it's not, I mean, 
who knows, but it's, uh, it's not likely that it's gonna end up in some inhabited planet somewhere, so it's not quite analogous. It's true that if, if a spaceship shows up here, we won't know if its creators uh, intended for it to show up here or uh, if they're still around, but chances are it wouldn't make it to Earth unless it was actually piloted to Earth. New Horizons isn't piloted to anywhere after it leaves the solar system. Your first question was about what the view from a tall mountaintop on Pluto or equivalently from a satellite sharing the big one um, would be like compared to standing on a mountain on, on the Earth. And as you can imagine, because it's a smaller ball, the, there's, there's more um, curvature to be seen. So uh, in fact, the Apollo astronauts who walked on the moon and climbed up various hills and mountains there said that that was a very dramatic um, demonstration of what a smaller world the moon is because the horizon is much closer and uh, they could see evidence of curvature, which you never see from the surface of the Earth. It's like you're on a flat plane, even though we know that that's just your limited view. So on Pluto, which is smaller than Earth's moon, um, you would actually see that curvature even more prominently. And on Charon, that's smaller still, you would see it still more prominently. So it would be a little mind-bending for any of us to be on a world like that. And, and the fact that the atmosphere is so thin, it wouldn't be obscuring. I mean, on Earth, you look off to the distance, and, and, and it's kind of obscured by the scattering of the atmosphere. On Pluto, there is an atmosphere, but it would, it's, it's not enough to really affect your view in that same way. So are Charon and Pluto considered a binary planet system, then? Yes, they are, because they're close enough to one another and massive enough that their gravitational balance point is between the two, just like a binary star. And also on Pluto, would the sky look blue, then, just like on Earth? Yes, it would. Sputnik plane has convection cells in it and uh, a lot of energy coming out. Is, is that a relic of an impact crater? The basin that Sputnik lies in is thought to be an impact basin. But Sputnik itself is, is a coal trap where uh, uh, the volatiles, the ices, have accumulated uh, into a, a more or less a frozen ocean of nitrogen, uh, which is convecting overturning in these cells that you see in that, that geological cells, not, not biological cells, um, in these cellular patterns due to some heat source from below. We don't know what that heat source is. We have some ideas, and we're not sure which one's right. Uh, we're not sure if any of them are right, actually. I'm wondering how you kept the morale and enthusiasm of your team up for all those years. You know, it wasn't hard, actually. Um, uh, this was such a prize project. You know, in, um, in the generation of, the, the real first generation of planetary scientists um, who uh, uh, came before us, and when the space age was very young, um, the most prized missions were the first missions to Mars and to Venus and to Jupiter and so forth. Uh, and they swept, you know, in the space of literally from 1962 to 1989, 27 years, they did all the planets, eight of them, all the way out to Neptune. And those were the most important missions to be on. And, and there was a lot of competition to get on those missions. When we had a chance to form a team to go to Pluto, the last of the classical planets, that's the last train to Clarksville. That's the last first mission, as David said. And so we had the pick of the litter in terms of talent, but also people were very motivated to stay on this project all the way to the end and to make sure it worked because it was the project of a lifetime. And that's exactly what it turned out to be. In fact, a lot of us get questions, you know, like, what are you going to do next? Or are you going to have a nervous breakdown now that, <laughs> you know, after you've climbed your Everest or, you know, you did your Apollo 11 or whatever. But it actually turns out that having accomplished it is, is so fulfilling that you don't need your next Everest. You know, I already did that. And a lot of people on the project who worried in all the years we were flying to Pluto what it would be like after we accomplished it. Would it be like a loss because it wasn't in our future? Actually found that the results were so spectacular and the accolades were so strong that they felt like they'd made a real contribution to history. And we talk about that a little bit in Chasing New Horizons. You know, let me just add, because uh, Alan's too modest to tell you this, but part of the secret of the, the uh, morale um, staying up was, uh, was, was good leadership and um, Alan always made sure to kind of mark anniversaries and have celebrations along the way. And he also has, um, I would say, sort of a, a, an impish sense of humor that would at times uh, 
spread throughout the team, and he, he would do things like, um, there was this one um, uh, near miss with, with a real dangerous episode on the spacecraft. Um, was that the Lori Sun point, the knock yeah. on wood? Yeah, where, where one of the instruments, you know, accidentally um, almost, uh, you know, briefly looked at the sun in a way that could have burnt out the detectors, fortunately didn't, and then they figured out what they had done wrong and they were never gonna do that again. And one of the uh, flight uh, controllers, uh, one of the engineers said, oh boy, you know, that was close, we better knock on wood. And Alan was there and he noticed that in, in the whole control room, um, it was all like uh, modern furniture and there was nothing actually made out of wood. So Alan went home and, and took all these cutting boards and cut them into little pieces um, and uh, you know, put, a little, put a little plaque on each one and sent them to all the flight controllers and said, Here, here's your piece of wood, put this on your desk for the whole rest of the mission and whenever you need to knock on wood, here it is. And he was, he was always kind of doing these sort of goofy things and I think that uh, you know, in with all the hard work, those sort of moments of humor um, really helped as well. And uh, thank you all so much for coming. Unfortunately, we got to go.